Welcome back everyone. In today's video, I will be talking about costuming in Bollywood period movies. Through examining three movies set in three very different eras, I will show you how the Indian costume changed through the time, while also determining if the costumes were historically accurate, were in line with the concept and storytelling of the movie, and if they gave any additional information about the character wearing them. I originally wrote this essay as my final dissertation for my master's in production design. To research this topic, I went all out, looking for information in four different countries. Here in Hungary I raided the library of the East Asian Museum. In London I visited the Victorian Albert. In Chandigarh I bought all the books I could find in the topic. And in Venice I happened on a Mughal jewelry exhibition with amazing books in its gift shop. So here's my haul from all this. <laughs> These books I bought in Chandigarh's used university book market. They are mostly historical books and art history books. Good for context but not much more. These books are some random Indian fashion and art books I found in the bookstores. These books I had to specially order them into a bookshop because I could not find them otherwise. This one is Banu Ataya's biography. Remember her because she will come up later in this video. And these two are my most prized possessions. An amazing book series about the ancient and medieval costumes of India. This one is the catalogue of the jewelry exhibition I've been to. And I also got this amazing book of Akbar which came super supremely handy as one of the movies I chose is about the life of Akbar. The movies I chose is Mohenjo-daro giving a peek into the ancient era of India, Juda Akbar showing you the late medieval and Lagan the Victorian British Raj era of India. All three were directed by Ashutosh Govarike. Principal costumes were made by April Ferry and Nita Lula, Mohenjo Daro, Nita Lula, Joda Akbar, and Banu Ataya, Lagan. Nita Lula is an amazingly successful designer with her own fashion label and many, many award winning films. Banu Ataya was one of the most famous Indian costume designers in the world. She started her career with Raj Kapoor's films, but the international success came with Richard Attenborough's Gandhi in 1982 with which she won an Oscar, first one to be ever awarded to an Indian designer. Her designs for Lagan were also Oscar nominated. The 2016 period action adventure film set in 2016 BCE at the height of the Harappan or more commonly known the Indus Valley civilization follows the journey of Salman who travels to the city of Mohenjo-daro where love, intrigue and the secrets of his past confront him. The director Ashotush spent two years previous to filming with research to better understand the historical context of the Harappan civilization. In 2014 he invited April Ferry, an American costume designer with multiple awards to design the costumes of the film. But after her contract expired, she returned to America to work on the sixth season of Game of Thrones. Yeah, that one. The work was taken up by Nita Lula. To this day, we don't know much about the Indus Valley civilization. Even their writing system has not yet been deciphered. From archaeological survey, we know that they were very, very developed. Their planned cities had covered sewer systems and public baths to ensure public hygiene. We know even less of what they wore as organic material has not lasted. From petrified seeds, bone needles, spindles and buttons, we can deduce that they used cotton silk and wool and they knew how to sew and dye textiles. Those couple of statues that survived are mostly naked but wear elaborate headdresses and a lot a lot of jewelry. Luckily there is a good amount of jewelry found during excavations from which we know that the nobles wore gold, silver or copper bejeweled with precious stones while the poorer class wore copper, clay or shell necklaces, rings and belts. Because we don't have the full picture of how the Indus Valley people dress, the director gave free reign for the costume designers. I cannot make a movie with so much nudity, obviously. It will not be uh, a good uh, family viewing. Definitely. So I had to create a costume which will be away from all the different styles that we have seen in other movies and yet be special for 
the civilization. In this instance, censorship and marketability of the film won over historical accuracy. But let's see how immersive is the world the costume designers created with these limitations. I will look at the two main characters' costumes in detail. The male lead, played by Hrithik Roshan, and the female lead, played by Pujahed. The main character, Saman, grew up in a little village with his indigo farmer aunt and uncle. When he finally goes to the big city, Mohenjo-daro, everything in his life changes. During the film, Saman wears three types of tops and two types of buttons in various colors. From the top, he wears in the first scene, he has a sienna brown version, and from the dotty, a beige and a blue one too. These four colors, white, beige, indigo and brown, dominate his palette. Colors are one of the most effective tools in a costume designer's head. If used right, they can give you subliminal additional information about the character. In this case, someone's main color, white, is the typical good guy color in traditional cinema. Just think of any western movie. Good guys always wear white while the antagonist wears black. His other colors, for instance the beige and the brown he often wears, are earth colors. They symbolize stability and protection. It's not a coincidence that he wears a brown shirt in the scene he saves Johnny. And I cannot help but think that the blue shirt he wears refers back to his family's business as well as symbolizing loyalty, trustworthiness and power. All of these colors tell the story of the character even before we see his actions. When we first meet someone returning to his village triumphantly after killing a crocodile, he wears an unwhitened shirt and a white dhoti. The dhoti is a 4 to 5 meter long rectangular fabric that is folded into this type of loose pants. It's one of the oldest clothing items of India, still popular today thanks to its practicality and confidence. It evolved from the ancient clothing item called Antaria. In ancient times, the people of the tropical Indian subcontinent wore free unsewn pieces of cloth as clothes, as fabric required a lot of manual labor and it was very expensive. Thus, cutting into it and creating waste or sewing it so only one size of person can wear it would be considered very foolish. The biggest cloth a person would wear to cover the lower part of the body is called the antaria. The antaria was secured at the waist by a sash or kaya bond. The third item of clothing, called utaria, was a sort of a shawl worn in several ways to suit the wearer. It could be worn around the shoulders or draped across the body diagonally or laborers wore it on their head for protection against the sun or around the necks to wipe their hands or faces with during hard labor on the fields. As an unsewn item, the dhoti can be draped in many many ways, similarly to the sari. For someone's top, the designer probably took a later piece of clothing of Greek origins as inspiration, the kanchuka or tunic. Its earliest depiction was found on a stupa from 100 BCE. Many of the villages wear overlapping style tops closing on one side with ties. For this design, the base was probably the angarki, a long-sleeved, asymmetric coat or top. When Saman arrives to Mohenjo-daro, he wears a top made from two different cloths. On the bottom, a top with a deep V neckline and on the top, an asymmetric piece of clothing tied on the sides with unfinished edges. And what is this? It it has no function, it's not aesthetic in any way. And it's just, why would anyone wear this? Other than to look rugged and ancient in a Hollywood way? When Chani was born, a Brahmin said that her decisions will decide the future of Mohenjo-daro. So she's been kept as the chosen one of the goddess Sindhu. The many goddess statues uncovered by archaeologists give a bit broader view into the dresses of the female inhabitants of the Indus Valley than we had of the rest of the population. One of the most noteworthy foundings is the dancing girl, a bronze statue depicting a nude young woman with a lot of jewelry. It blows my mind how her bangles remind me of how girls in rural areas of India still wear their churya in a very, very similar way. Chani's first ever dress, we and Salman see her, is a long dark blue dress lined with crimson red. The piece has a front opening, many layers of fabric, tie high slits of both legs, 15th century inspired long sleeves and a bra decorated with Beats? What is this, a belly dancer's costume? Well, at least the color is on point, as the blue in 
Christian traditions is the color of Virgin Mary, strengthening her association with a goddess and her spirituality. But beneath the thing blue, we see the crimson red peeking out from the slits of the dress, bringing in associations of sexuality and desire. No wonder she catches Salman's eyes immediately. Sadly, throughout the movie, she wears the same dress a couple more times in different colors. With these dresses, she wears a headdress reminding us of once seen in the goddess figurines. As the director said, There are different kinds of headdresses that are there in the figurines. The one which I have created for Chani is something that is a kind of a milder form. Personally, I'm not a big fan of hers as I do like big eye-catching headpieces, but it could be worse. A lot worse. Interestingly, she doesn't wear any other jewelry other than the headdresses like the statues of the era would suggest her to do. Like, these dancing girls know what's up. When Chan is away from the public eye, she wears more relaxed clothing. But still no bangles? Oh well, at least I can appreciate those shell earrings. Funny how this DIY knotted saffron colored top and Langa combination looks a little bit maybe what you would imagine era appropriate, yet it's in such a contrast with her previous super tailored and modern looking outfit. When Chani decides to escape and meet Salman, her incognito clothes seem to be DIY again. But confusingly, this time she wears the shirt I had when I was 17, a web skirt and something on top of it. <laughs> Again, I can't decide if this weirdly wrapped and tied shawl is supposed to be fashion or function. Because it's neither. <laughs> At least they share their love of useless upper clothing with Zaman, who don't his horrific counterpart. In the next scene, where she performs the sacred moon ritual at the big bath, she wears a light pure white semi-transparent sari with a top made from the same fabric. The sari is probably South Asia's most known unstitched garment. There are thousands and thousands of ways of tying this strong rectangular fabric. The dimensions of the sari change from region to region and cost to cost. Its length also depends on the way you drape it. Today the most popular is the 8 meter sari tied into the navy style. Chani's dress too imitates the navy style, although her dress is obviously pre-sewn. The sari was traditionally worn either without a top or with a piece of cloth wrapped around the torso or a bit later with a short blouse or a choli. The sari, being an unsewn garment, is traditionally considered pure and unsoiled by stitching and it symbolizes nobility. And now for my favorite costume of the whole film, paired with the worst headdress, Johnny's wedding outfit. I love this dress so much, it's the perfect blend of era-appropriate unsewn cloths shaped into something of a gown, complemented by lots and lots of jewelry. Its color, the red, is the traditional wedding color of India, symbolizing prosperity, fertility and the love between the couple. Okay, now let's talk about the headdress. Why are there plastic flowers on it? And what is this common river shell? If there was ever a time to bust out a big eye-catching headdress, this would have been it. It's just really such a missed opportunity. Overall, I'd say that the costumes of this movie did not convince me. They were anachronistic to a point that they took me out of the flow. It's such a shame though, as the art department has worked so hard to recreate the city of the Mohenjo-daro based on blueprints of the actual archaeological site and every other aspect of the film was so well researched. I wish the characters were less modern looking pieces, more jewelry and well, less tops. I mean, I understand censorship would never allow half nudity, but you could like almost accidentally cover up the ladies, like uh, in Avatar. This was my idea of a more historically accurate Chani based on a goddess figurine from the Indus Valley. I mean, I know even this is a bit of an overkill or, you know, something like this. Using the Utaria as some sort of a cover. I mean, the wedding dress did it so well. I just wish I could forget that belly dancer outfit. Now, let's see something that's an absolute treat for the eyes. 
The 2008 box office hit and multiple award winner film Jodha Akbar centers on the romance between the Mughal Emperor and Rajput Princess Jodha Bai. Akbar, back then called Jaluddin Mohammed, got on the throne at the young age of 11 following his father's death. He was known for his reforms where he tried to bring the Muslim Mughal nobility and the Hindu populace closer together. He was the first who instead the Mongolian Turkish nomadic dress preferred by his father and grandfather adopted the lighter more suited to the weather, Indian clothing to the court. Fun fact, the word Mogul comes from the word Mongol, Mongolian, referring to Genghis Khan, the mother's side ancestor of Babur, the founder of the Mughal dynasty. But they actually call themselves Timurid, after the father's side ancestor of Babur, Timur. In the movie, Akbar is a just and kind ruler. His costumes consist of a knee length jama, a patka on his waist, and a pajama underneath. Explanations for all of this are coming. He often also wears a nadiri on top, turban on his head and juti on his feet. The jama was Akbar's own invention. He adopted the chatkar jama to his own taste, giving it a more elegant, noble form. The bodice follows the line of the body, overlapping and closing on one side, right for the Muslims and left for the Hindus. This way, Akbar created a court dress that was both uniform and showed the religion of its wearer. Around the end of the 16th century, the jama was made from such a light cotton that it was semi-transparent allowing a colorful pajama underneath to be the statement piece. Fun fact, this outfit was popular among women of the court too who took the fashion of the tight pajamas so far that it has been said that they had to be sewn into it and had to be cut out of it at the end of the day. As it's evident in the film too, the jama was often worn with a richly embroidered patka on the waist by the nobility. But this sash-like garment wasn't just a simple accessory, it was also a status symbol. Some versions of it, like the shashtush, could only be worn by the royal family and those who have been gifted one. Kritik in the film often wears a knee-length sleeveless coat over his jama called a nadiri. But both on the miniatures and on the extant garment you can see that historically it was a bit shorter than the costume in the film. The costumes are often accompanied by turbans. The Akbari Pagri was a new kind of pug or turban that was less heavy than its Asian and Persian counterparts using a new style of wrapping. The turban is often decorated with precious stone jewelry, sarapesh or kilangi, that can only be worn by the emperor. Both men and women wore juti or mojari at the time and in this film too. This Rajasthani footwear was adopted by Akbar to replace the nomadic heavy boots of his ancestors. This light, leather slipper-like footwear is popular to this day in India. The Mughal era was the golden age of textile production in India. The new dye sources, advancement of weaving skills, the royal patronage and the incorporation of new motifs culminated in an amazing repertoire of painted and printed woven in embroidered textiles. The painted and printed Kalamkari cotton later dubbed chintz, the muslin that was so fine that it was practically transparent the metal embellished pattern silk known as Banarasi and the heavier silk brocades were that what the court mainly wore. Unfortunately, most of these textiles are not represented in the film. During the movie, we often see Akbar in white costumes. That is actually a historically accurate detail, as according to historical documents, whenever he could, he wore a simple white java. Although his main color is white, he also wears beige, orange, red, green and gold colors too. These colors probably refer to the fact that with the Mughals, new color dyes came to the Indian peninsula. The traditionally used earthen colors were supplemented by new shades, pistachio from granadine and vibrant orange from saffron. We see all of these colors used in the palette of the costumes. As the Mughal era was known for its grandiosity, I used a lot of warm tones. Yellow, saffron, emerald greens used by the Rajputs for ash and gold brown and beige is used by the Mughals for a critic. My personal favorite scene is when Akbar goes to the Rajput court to retrieve Joda and all the costumes are the shades of red, yellow and orange. Even the king and the sets match in. I also love how Akbar's orange is matched with Joda's jewelry of the same shade. Critic has 
two especially memorable costumes in the film, the wedding dress and the one he wears to the celebration. The base of the wedding dress is a mustard yellow silk jama with a shorter sleeved zardosi nadiri on top. The zardosi is a type of embroidery where they use gold or silver buyer to embroider with. It originated in Persia and it reached a high degree of sophistication during the patronage of Akbar. There are many varieties of zardosi and ari embroidery that use different type of wire threads, sequins, beads, pearls and even gems to embellish. The emperor's patka is a red and gold brocade with a kalasha motif. It imitates the water jug used in weddings and functions. The jug symbolizes the life-giving water as well as the mother's womb and it means fertility and abundance. During the wedding ceremony, he also wears one of my favorite Indian male accessories. Historically was made from flowers, nowadays from beads, that's supposed to protect the wearer from the evil eye. Another interesting detail that you might have caught is the amazing amount of jewelry he's wearing. In India, ownership of great jewels was considered an intrinsic aspect of kingship. The finest jewels were not worn by women but by men as a reflection of the wealth and power of the state. The jewelry used in the movie were made from actual gold and precious stones using historical techniques. They found craftsmen who still remembered the original practices and brought them on to work for the production. 200 craftsmen worked on the project for 600 days and used 300 kilograms of precious stones and pearls. This amazing feat, the attention to every last detail is what takes Bollywood above and beyond anything I have ever witnessed in film production. The emerald and rhinestone sword page is made with the kundan technique where the gem is set with a soft 24 karat gold foil the kundan between the stone and its mount. The significance and symbolism of the emeralds are part of an ancient tradition of India and the Islamic world. In Islamic tradition, the color green is considered the favorite of the Prophet Muhammad, thus emeralds were very very popular among Mughal nobility. And it is widely believed that serpents and demons could be blinded when they looked at the emeralds. No wonder then that Akbar's costumes are often accompanied by jewelry, utilizing a lot of emeralds and pearls. The sarapesh is accompanied by a five-strand Menakari pearl necklace matching the bracelets. The Menakari technique consists of surrounding the embedded gems with enamel. After the relatively peaceful times of the Harappan civilization, a lot has changed on the peninsula. The many raiding attacks from the north made the people realize that women were safer kept indoors and covered up. The Rajput dress was made up from the Ganga or skirt, the kanchli or top, and the dupatta or scarf. The sewn blouse was introduced to India by the Sakas. This Middle Asian garment was bigger and warmer than the kanchli, angia or choli that developed from it. The kanchli or kanchali is a hip length wider top with sleeves, while the choli is a nowadays popular top that leaves the midriff and the back mostly bare. In Hindu circles, it was accepted to leave the arms and the legs and the midriff uncovered, but according to the purda, Noble women could not be gazed at by men outside of the family. As such, inside the palace, Judah always covered her head, and when outside, she wore a veil. As we see it in the film too. Aishwarya's costumes consists of a gangra choli, filled with a transparent dupatta, wearing astounding amounts of jewelry. She mostly wears warm colors, emerald green, vivid yellow, and white. All of her costumes are magnificent, but let's get to the point and take a look at her wedding dress. It's in the traditional red, lavishly decorated with zari work, incorporating tons of tiny mirrors, beads and stones. Lula designed the pattern for the embroidery herself. We can find the kalasha motif again, reflecting the one on Akbar's patka. The wedding jewelry set was the heaviest among all. It weighed 3.5 kilograms. Her jewels combined elements of the Mughal as well as the Rajput traditions. The basic difference was that Mughal jewelry was much more finer in craftsmanship and Rajput jewelry was more rustic. At that time, Mughals used a lot more pearls than the Rajputs did. In the 16th century, Rajput women used to wear 12 pieces of jewelry. In the wedding scene, she wears all of them. In the close-up shots, you can see her cartful jumka, an earring incorporating the shape of a flower and a bell. The borla, or bell-shaped ornament, is kept on the forehead by strings. The knot, or nose ring, is a jewelry of Muslim origin that was adopted to India in the 9th to 10th century and became a traditional wedding ornament and a symbol of married women, so much so that the brides are now wished, may your knot be ever present, meaning 
may you never become a widow. The odd or choker and the gorgeous and enormous necklace are without a doubt the heaviest pieces of the whole set. The odd was the centerpiece of the bride's wedding trestle that symbolized her transition from girl to woman. This ornament was also meant to display the wealth and rank of the bride's family. The bigger and heavier the odd looked, the greater was the status of the bride's family. Joda's hair is decorated with billi discs. On her upper arm she wears a bayou bond and on her wrists Churia. The Churia is such an important part of her bride set that there is even a Punjabi ceremony, the Chura, where the maternal uncle puts them on the bride, surrounded by the rest of the family. On her tongue, Joda wears an Arsi, a large mirrored ring. Finally, Diamond and Pearl Pizeb or Anklet, that again remind me of this 1800s museum piece that's back is decorated with enamel. So it is very very possible that the one in the movie has similar surprises. The last touch is the two pairs of pichia that's a traditional wedding wear, especially in South India, where they are worn in pairs on the second toe. Another very significant piece of jewelry is the one Akbar gifts to Joda when he's courting her. The Kundan necklace is made according to tradition. There are no two stones of the same shape, yet the final piece looks completely symmetrical. It's an interesting point to make that while Europeans were striving to make every stone into symmetrical geometric shapes, Indians enjoyed them in their natural beauty. I'm sure you heard the tale of the Kohinoor, the diamond that was set in the back of the Indian throat before the British took it and polished it to nearly half of its original size. Joda Akbar was a defining film in terms of fashion and costume design. It brought back the golden age of the Mughal era, and its influence was what made the Lenga Choli and the Kundan jewelry popular again. Suddenly, every bride wanted to wear the dresses and jewelry of Choda, and the big brands responded with haste. Danishk created a new collection of more wearable versions of the film jewelry, earning millions and millions with it. As the spokesman of the jewelry making company said, whatever Bollywood wears becomes a trend. So why should we not gain from the wave which it is going to create? The costumes brought a similar success. Its modernized versions were sold by Sasam Sara Boutique. There were 18 sets designed by Nita for the boutique worth thousands of rupees. As she stated about the collection, no matter how westernized we get, our Indian look is deep rooted. This high level of entwining of film and business reminds me of the golden age of Hollywood, when movies were made to advertise and fashion copied the latest latest costumes of the silver screen. And as delightful as it is to watch every single frame of this movie, once the end credits roll, are there any costumes that really stuck in your mind? The 2001 award-winning film is set in the time of the British occupation. Due to the drought, the farmers can't pay the tax to the British, so they are challenged to a cricket match that will decide if they will have to pay double or nothing at all. The film is directed by our good old friend at this point, Ashutosh Govariker, and the main characters are Bhuvan, played by Amir Khan, Gaurid, played by Gracie Singh, Captain Russell by Paul Bechthorn, and his sister Elizabeth by Rachel Shelley. With the collapse of the Mughal Empire, the British had their chance of strengthening their position on the Indian Peninsula. In 1858, India officially became the colony of the United Kingdom. The occupying British brought a very different culture and costuming traditions with them that were soon more or less adopted by the Indian population. There are so many funding contradictions between these two fashion cultures. For example, if a Victorian gentleman wants to show respect they will take their hats off. But taking one's turban off in public was totally disrespectful. Indians show respect by taking off their shoes before entering the temples. While if you take off your shoe to go into a church in Europe, everyone would be a little bit surprised. Lagan shows this difference between the Indian working people and the ruling British class beautifully. These differences were masterfully underlined by the designer's choice of colors. I chose pale pastel colors to contrast with the bright Indian colors. The British soldiers wear beige uniforms, basically becoming one with the arid land. The cricket team wears white, with red jackets and ascots. And these are the colors the British men predominantly wear. In contrast, the Indian ladies wear vibrant warm colors creating a colorful crowd in the background. The other very dominant difference you can spot 
is the use of textiles. The British Industrial Revolution produced textiles in great quantity for cheap, endangering the traditional craftsmen of Indian textile production. It is exactly this reason why Gandhi's khadi became the symbol of the freedom movement. In this question, Banu sides with Gandhi saying, I created the entire wardrobe for the villagers with hand looms and khadi and did not touch mill fabrics. To contrast this, she dressed the British in wall and other factory-made textiles. All the costumes were designed by Banu and made in Mumbai. In her book, she talks about how local tailors were not used to creating Victorian pin tucks and other details, so she had to spend an entire month training them how to do so. Elizabeth, like most women of her status, got to India by following a male relative there. Seeing the injustices against the locals and against the will of her brother, she decides to help them learn how to play cricket. During her time with them, she learns to appreciate the locals' lifestyle and falls in love with Bhuvan. Her costumes are somewhat modernized versions of Victorian clothes, long skirts and dresses with big hats and pastel colors assigned to the British. Whenever she's around the villagers, she sticks out like a sore thumb. Although her dresses are not completely historically accurate, they are close enough for the untrained eyes that you can enjoy the movie no problem. Until we get to the ballroom scene. This was such a missed opportunity to show how comical the Victorian fashions would have been in contrast to the Indian ones. Because instead of putting this on the screen we get this an off-the-shoulder modern ball gown that was obviously chosen to not be too jarring to the modern Indian audience. But I think it should be jarring. They should have petticoats, corsets, ginormous puffy sleeves and everything that comes with it. It's such a shame that the filmmakers were not brave enough to take this step. Elizabeth's brother, the aggressive racist soldier who uses his position to get what he wants, represents all that's wrong with the British colonizations of India. His rotten interior is covered by immaculate outfits. He always wears the uniform of the British in beige's white khakis. The only aggressive color is the red he wears, being the coat that gives the British military the red coat's name. Gauri is the female lead, the main character Bhuvan's love interest. She mostly wears warm colors, especially oranges and saffron, emphasizing her lively personality. She always wears a choli or short blouse with a gagra or skirt with a dupatta or shawl covering her head. In the first scene, she wears a red block print skirt with an orange choli and a red and black bandhani dupatta. Block print is one of the most ancient ways of decorating textiles. There are three widely used techniques of block printing in India. Direct printing, resist printing and discharge printing. Direct printing sees the fabric bleach first, then dyed and then finally printed using carved wooden blocks. First the outline blocks and then the blocks to fill in the color. Resist printing requires some areas of the fabric to be protected from the dye, which are shielded with the use of a double. The last technique of discharge printing, on the other hand, sees the use of chemicals to remove portions of dyed fabric, which are then filled in with different colors. The bantani is an antique batik dyeing technique where following some pattern, the artist puts tiny knots on the fabric with the help of a naklo, a device worn on the finger that ends in a blonde point. The the fabric is then painted, usually to yellow, red, blue or green, but it stays white underneath the knotted parts. On the Janmashtani celebration during the song number, Gauri wears a simple saffron colored outfit, as does Bhuvan and most of the villagers, as saffron is Krishna's favorite color and this is his celebration after all. Gauri wears simple oxidized silver jewelry, gold wasn't just too expensive but it also symbolizes the sun and it is only supposed to be worn by kings and nobles. Bhuvan dresses very simply, usually wearing a combination of a dhoti and a gamucha in light colors. There are only two exceptions when instead he wears saffron colors for the celebration and when Elizabeth confesses her love to him. Interesting detail is that in that scene, while Elizabeth wears a white and brown dressing gown, he and Gauri matches in colors so it's not even a question of which lady he will choose in the end. The gamucha is a traditional thin coarse cotton scarf that originates from the ancient Antaria and it is used in a very similar way. Speaking of, the only difference between Bhuvan's costumes and Salman's from Mohenjo-daro are the button shirts he wears. With the advent of sewing machines and buttons, the fashion for Indian men has changed 
drastically. During the 19th century, the more and more westernized fashions left the once popular jama, angarka and choga behind for more tailored suits made to size following the contours of the body, such as the chapkan, achkan and sherwani. As usually, it was the nobility who first adopted this new fashion and it trickled down from there. The divide between the classes of Indians shows very well in the film too. The Raja is wearing a sherwani with standing Nehru colors and his household wears achkan and sherwani too, all nicely tailored and made to fit, while the villagers' only sewn items are their tops. The achkan is a knee-length jacket, closing in the middle or on the side that has a court and everyday version. The Sherwani is a bit shorter, it's usually made from a heavier fabric and it has a lining. It's a combination of the Indian kurta and the English frock coat. Both garments started as a court wear but today grooms wear it all over India. The Indian cricket team enlists all people from the lowest untouchable caste to the wealthiest landowner. In her book the designer eludes that they were all dressed according to their professions but sadly she doesn't really go into detail. But I did manage to figure out a couple of them. Rajesh Vivek's character, the holy fool, wears an eye-catching patchwork shawl over his kurta dhoti. In the Maurya Empire, the pauper Buddhist monks made their clothes from the patches of clothes donated to the temple and dyed them red or yellow. As their significance grew, so did the quality of the patches, but the style remained. In Japan, the monks' robes are called kasha and the patchwork follows strict rules. And I think this is how the fortune-telling fool of the village was given a connection to the religion by the designer. Pradeep Ravat plays a Sikh soldier who joins the cricket team as a revenge after leaving the British army. The followers of the Sikh Sikh religion wear five symbols, so they are easy to spot. They are called the Panch Kakar or the five Ks. The symbols are the Kesh, uncut hair, that's kept in a bun by a wooden comb, the Kanga, worn under a turban by men, the Kachara or sewn white cotton shorts symbolize purity. The kirpan or jeweled dagger symbolizes their readiness to always defend their faith. And the kara, a metal bangle that symbolizes eternity with its circular shape and the shield that protects the wearer from evil. In the movie, Deva Singh wears most of these symbols, except for the kirpan that instead on his side, it hangs on his necklace in the form of a medal. All in all, I love this movie. Both the story and the costuming. It's like a fairy tale and if you haven't watched it i can highly recommend it from all of the movies as much as i love the splendor of joe dagbar i preferred the costuming choices of this one the color code the costumes even if not most historically accurate for the british helped the story with utmost subtlety underpinning the cultural differences of the different social groups of the time the designers created a believable and human scenery where the characters didn't change costumes every scene but mix and match their existing wardrobe pieces and as this video is getting way too long let's stop here for now so, which film costumes did you like the most? Leave a comment down below. And before you go, don't forget your badge! Thank you for sticking with me all through the end and have a good day!